I'm Pastor Bob. Good to see you, Lena. Bless you. And, and I just want to bless each one of you. Each one of you. And everyone else tuning in over the internet. Anywhere in this world. Just want to say thank you all for being here tonight. And I'm Pastor Bob, but if you would like to call me, you could reach me at area code 561 331 7533. I've been doing a lot of meditation on a set of verses in Psalm 119. The most recent meditation has been on Psalm 119, starting with verse 33. In verse 33 through verse 40. And when I'm meditating on these verses, Psalm 119, verse 33 through verse 40, at times I'll jump over to statements made by the Apostle Paul, especially in his letter to the Romans or his letter to the Corinthians. At times I'll jump over to the Apostle's teachings because I'll see parallels between what the Apostle was talking about as a writer of the new approach to the covenant. We call it the new covenant, but it's really a new way of life in relationship to God's ancient covenant of you know his teaching, laying out in the Bible what is his good, pleasing, and perfect way to live. Well, Jesus didn't come along until maybe 2,500 years after the time of Psalm 119 being written, right? And yet there's so many things that the guy is saying in Psalm 119 that remind me of what we call the New Covenant, which is a new covenant of the Spirit, and Jesus is mediator of that covenant. So let me just start with my opening meditation on Psalm 119, verse 33. Okay. By the way, my wife and daughter should be arriving very soon, so <laughs> I expect them to come. Okay, so Psalm 119, starting with verse 33. This is essentially the NIV that I'm going to be using, but in verse 33, Lord, teach me the way of your decrees. Then, by you teaching me the way of your decrees, I may follow them. I may follow the way of your decrees to the end. Okay? So, there's a statement being made here about God's decrees. And the psalmist says what we want to say right now. Lord, teach us the way of your decrees. Because by you teaching me and us the way of your decrees, we will be able, therefore, because you've taught us, to follow the way of your decrees to the end. Meaning, to follow them forever. So, Lord, I just pray right now that you would help me just, just to survey these verses, starting with verse 33, but let me just survey through verse 40, and then after I survey that, I'll go back and make parallels with teaching from the Apostle Paul. So thank you, Father God, for, for, for letting me start out with this prayer, which is the psalmist prayer of Psalm 119, verse 33. Lord, teach me and teach us, I'm saying, the way of your decrees, then I will be able to follow the way of your decrees to the end, as in forever. And then we're going to survey this thing to the next verse, Psalm 119, verse 34. Give me understanding. And then what happens when, Lord, you give us understanding? Then this will be the result. I will keep and obey your law with all of my heart. So that's the meditation that later on we want to unpack as I give my comments, but I'm just surveying right now. 
Psalm 119, verse 34. This is what the psalmist prays, and this is what I'm praying for us too. Lord, give me understanding. Because by your giving me understanding, I'll be able to keep and obey your law, your Torah, your guiding instruction, or your instructive guidance. The way of life. The, the way that you teach us to live. So, verse 34. Give me understanding. That way I will be able to keep and obey your instructive guidance with all of my heart. And then he says, in the same Psalm 119, verse 35. Direct me in the paths of your commands. For in the paths of your commands, I find delight. Now, delight could be rendered pleasure. It could be rendered happiness. It could be rendered enjoyment or a good feeling. So I want to say all of those things apply here in verse 35. Direct me, Lord. It's all a prayer. So far, all these verses that I'm commenting on right now are prayers to God. You know, first teach me and then give me understanding and, and now direct me. You know, it's all prayer, right? But in verse 35, Lord, direct me in the path of your commands. For there in the path of your commands, I find delight, enjoyment. It feels good. I love being directed in the path of your commands because I, I just... I just feel great about it when I'm walking in that path of your commands. So direct me in that path. Because in your commands I find delight. I just really feel good, Lord, when I'm in your commands. And then, in the survey of this passage in Psalm 119, going on to verse 36. This is uh, deep in my mind, but this is what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, Do okay, <laughs> Let me, let me say, the, the, the word that I'm getting is, is turn. He's praying to God in verse 36. He's saying, turn my heart towards your written instructions. Right? Turn my heart towards your statutes. That is your written instructions. But, but Lord, don't turn my heart the other way. Which is, don't turn my heart towards selfish gain. So, you know, he's saying in verse 36... It's all dependence on God. His prayer is always about depending on God. Lord, turn my heart towards your written instructions. That's the way I want you to turn my heart, towards your written instructions. But don't go the other way with me. Don't turn my heart towards selfish gain. And we're going to go on with verse 37 too. Verse 37. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. And I'm just going to make this brief comment. Lord, I know that, that in my life experience, I have had an experience on occasion, even more than one occasion, when my eyes were on some stuff that, that really were worthless. So the psalmist is praying turn my eyes, and he's depending on you, God, to do it. He's not, he's not deciding on his own. Hey, God, I promise to turn my eyes away from worthless things, so that, that's going to give me success. No, he doesn't depend on himself. He depends on God. And he says in verse 37, Lord, turn my eyes away from things that I'm looking at that are worthless to look at. And then the rest of that, verse 37, preserve my life according to your word. And then we're going to add verse 38. We'll go just for the circle. Go to verse 38. Fulfill your promise to your servant. Because the psalmist is saying, I'm your servant. So in verse 38, fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be revered. Why do I not say the NIV feared? Because the meaning of the Hebrew is to me reverence 
or worship or honor or respect, but not fear, because if it was fear, how could he call it back in verse 35, delight, enjoyment, happiness, pleasure, a good feeling, because fear doesn't produce those emotions, at least in my experience. Because for me, fear is the opposite of love. Why? Because in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. And we know in the same chapter 4 of 1 John that twice the statement is made, God is love. In that same chapter, right? So in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love as if to say there's no fear in God because He's love. There's no fear in love. But perfect love throws fear outside. And the person that fears is afraid of being punished. And if a person's afraid of being punished, then they don't yet grasp the perfect love. And then he throws in the next verse, the Apostle John does, we love God because He first loved us. So, this is to say in Psalm 119, verse 38, that I'm not going to say the feared of the NIV, but I'm going to say rather, verse 38, fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be revered. It does remind me of the Psalm 130, the 3 and 4, real quick parallel here to Psalm 130. Verses 3 and 4. O oh Lord, if you kept track of sins, who would be able to stand in your presence? Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. <laughs> amen. Yes, amen. Jesus, Jesus God Himself in human form, is standing before us as our human representative because God became flesh to stand before us as our human representative. So, so that's the question of Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. Lord, if you kept track of our sins, who could stand in your presence? But with you, there is forgiveness. Not based on us, but with God there's forgiveness. In other words, it's not... Lord, there might be forgiveness if we comply to the rules of what we have to do to get forgiven. No, it's Psalm 130, verse 3. Lord, we stand in your presence because of the forgiveness that's already true. Because of you, with you there is forgiveness so that you may be. This is the Psalm 130 going on to verse 4. With you there is forgiveness so that you may be not feared in the NIV here, but revered, honored, respected, worshipped. The goodness of God. And Kyle just reminded us of a good one in terms of a verse. Romans 2, verse 4. Yeah, Romans 2, verse 4. It's the goodness of God. It's the kindness of God that leads a person to the appropriate change of mind that will change their direction in life. It's the goodness and the kindness of God that leads a person to that change of mind and direction in life. Singleness. And it is singleness. Eye is single. The eye is single, Kyle is pointing out. That, that, that we're focused on the truth and Jesus reminds us that the truth will set us free. So, here's what I'm saying. In Psalm 119, in verse 38. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be revered. The same as Psalm 130, verse 4. God, we stand in your presence because of your forgiveness so that you may be revered. In other words, because you love us, we love you back. 1 John 4, 19. Why do we love God? Because He first loved us. He first forgave us. He didn't say, well, if you allow me to do half of the work to forgive you and then you do the other half of the work to receive the forgiveness, then it'll add up to your forgiveness. 
That's not the way it works with the new covenant that Jesus is the mediator of. That whole system of saying, if you receive my forgiveness, then you're going to be forgiven, that belongs to the covenant that would constitute Exodus chapter 20. You know, the Ten Commandments are introduced in Exodus chapter 20 all the way until Jesus died on the cross. That old approach to the covenant where it was based upon here's what you need to do and if you do it, then you're going to get the reward for doing it. And if you don't do it, you're going to get the punishment, namely death, for not doing it. Right? But you know when that approach to the covenant ended? You know, I mean, it started in Exodus 20 with the Ten Commandments, but you know when it ended? It, it, it ended the moment that Jesus uttered the words from the cross. It is finished. John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 30. When he said it is finished, he was citing the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy that Larry is reminding us of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. That the Messiah would finish the violation of the law. There would be no more violation of the law after he finished it. They would put an end to sin. That, that he would bring in atonement and reconciliation and even everlasting righteousness, which is his righteousness, etc. You know, Jesus is fulfilling the words of Daniel 9, 24, a prophecy, when he utters the words from the cross, it is finished, according to the statement in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus says it's finished, it means that that covenant relationship with God that is based on a 50-50 relationship, 50% of God and 50% of what's required of you, human being, well, that's over the moment that Jesus died on the cross with the identity of every human being that was obligated under the requirements of that old system of 50-50 responsibility to the human 50%, responsibility of God 50%, that whole thing died the moment Jesus died. You know why? Because when he died, he died legally as me. In other words, in the eyes of God, it was Bob Bue that died on that cross. Because when Jesus died on that cross as the innocent man, then he didn't deserve to be there on the cross. So he legally took the identity of Bob Bue so he could die. Because in Romans 5 verse 6, the only people that he died for are the people that are weak and sick and ungodly. In Romans 5, 7, the only people he died on behalf of are the people without righteousness and lacking goodness. Well, Bob Buse, you know, qualified so far. Romans 5, 8, the only people that he died on behalf of are people that are still not able to keep the law of God completely, which is to say I kept it all and therefore I'm righteous. Well, I haven't kept it all, so I'm not righteous. So I'm, I'm even in Romans 5.8 still being, in my experience, not my identity, but in my experience, still being a guy falling short of the glory of God. You know, But who did Jesus die on behalf of in Romans 5.8? Those being in their experience sinners. Those being in their experience people that, that, that keep screwing up, so to speak. Romans 5.8. God demonstrates His own love for us. Present tense in the Greek. Ongoing demonstration here. God demonstrates His own love for us in this fact that while we were still being sinners, the anointed, the anointed high priest died on behalf of us. Therefore, having been declared not guilty, having been acquitted in His blood, in His blood, in other words, it's the blood that Jesus shed, which is John 19.30, the statement at His shedding of the blood on the cross. It's, it's finished. I, I done it, God. I, I did the prophecy of Daniel 9.24. I, I got rid of sin. I identified the whole human race you know, from the first person to the last person to ever be born. I've identified with, with all of their sin, and, 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 and they all get legal credit for, for, for the fact that I give up my spirit and I'm dead on the cross. And it means the cancellation of all record of sin for all people. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. 
Lord, if you kept a record of sin, who could stand in your presence? But with you there is forgiveness. That's why, that's why the whole world can revere God and worship God and honor God. And that's why the whole world will worship God and honor God. Because we've got all of these prophecies that we don't have time to go through all of them tonight. Especially in the Psalms. We talk about all the nations are going to worship God. And Psalm 65 too. To you, the God that answers prayer, all flesh will come. And then you've got all these th prophecies about the everybody. Like Psalm 86, you know, which talks about it. About all nations will bow down and all people will worship you and everybody is going to honor you. And, and Isaiah 45, you know, about verse 23, God's made a decree. He's, 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 he's spoken a word and He's taken an oath and He won't take it back. He won't revoke His decree. That to me every knee will bow. Amen. And to me every tongue will swear allegiance. Amen. In the Lord alone is righteousness and strength. Amen. In other words, these are the decrees that I'm talking about. Isaiah 43. Excuse me. Isaiah 45. Verse 23. God has spoken a decree. He's, he's uttered an oath. And He's not taking it back. Why is everybody going to bow their knee? Why is everybody going to worship and honor and revere me? Why? Because in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, if you can recall that verse, which is in the context of a prophecy about a new approach to the covenant, it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, that all people are going to experience the Lord. All people are going to intimately know Him. On the basis that he, prophetically it says in Jeremiah's day about the future, he will forgive their wickedness and he will remember their sins no more. And so that everybody's going to revere him. Everybody's going to worship him. Everybody's going to intimately know him. Everybody's going to experience him. Everybody is going to come to the point of acknowledgement about Jesus is Lord. But he's also Savior. Jeremiah 31, 34. The promise of the New Covenant, the promise of the New Covenant, is that everybody that was ever under the covenant to begin with, everybody that had the obligation to obey the law to begin with, is in the future going to have an intimate relationship with God. Talk about re reverence rather than fear. Everybody is going to honor and respect Him. Everybody's going to know Him intimately because God's going to forgive. This is the New Covenant prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. He's going to forgive everybody's wickedness and, and, and hold everybody's sins against them no more. So that's why I said in Psalm 119, verse 38, that it's not fear, it's reverence. It's not fear, it's honor, respect, and worship. So repeating that, Psalm 119, verse 38, Lord, fulfill your promise to your servant. And I'm including the promise of the new covenant here. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be revered, and then he says in verse 39, this is Psalm 119, verse 39, take away the disgrace I dread. For your laws are good. Okay? Just to think about it for a moment. Take away the disgrace I dread. For your laws are good. I have more to say later when I get to my stage of commenting on the verses, because I'm surveying the verses still, right? I'm only to, to verse 39. Take away the disgrace I dread for your laws are good. But later on when I get a chance to comment, I want to talk about the new covenant law of forgiveness, the decree of God that you're forgiven. Talk about your laws are good. They really are. When you understand the laws have been fulfilled by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Equally, in Romans 3 verse 9 territory, Romans 3 verse 9, we've already made the charge that both Jews and non-Jews alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is not even one that's good. Nobody that understands. No one is seeking God. All have turned away, etc. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it was on behalf of everyone that was equally in the position of having a legal problem for which Jesus 
is the legal savior. So, review it. Psalm 119, verse 40. How I long for your guiding principles. Preserve your life, not talking about your life right now. It's talking about preserve my life. So at the end of verse 40, preserve my life in your righteousness. Because my life is only preserved in His righteousness. I only get righteousness because 2,000 years before I was... No, 2,000 years ago. Before I was born, Jesus is the righteous one that resurrected on behalf of me. Jesus resurrected on behalf of the human being, which is every human being, that on the basis of His righteousness, He resurrected. And because He resurrected, then He resurrected to establish, not by our decree, but by the Father's decree. It's the Father's decree. Jesus, you're the righteous one. You get the resurrection. You were innocent. You didn't deserve death. Your death was legally on behalf of others. So they get the death and you get the life. But then they get a new creation identity in your life. And they get to have their life preserved in your righteousness. Which is the prayer of Psalm 119, verse 40. How I long for your guiding principles in your righteousness preserve my life. Okay, now, let me just do this real quick. I just, just want to pray. Just, just, now, every time I say I just want to pray for a minute, it never works out that way. Okay? So I'll spare myself the details. Okay? Lord, we surveyed Psalm 119, verses 33 to verse 40. We surveyed it, Lord. We, we just started out with... with with, Lord, teach me the way of your decrees that I may follow the way of your decrees to the end. Lord, we, we went on to the next verse. Give me understanding because then when you give me the understanding, then with all my heart, I'll keep and obey your law. And then we looked at direct me in the path of your commands. For in the path of your commands, I'm, I'm literally on a high. That's what Psalm 119 translates into its modern language because I know it by my experience when I get into the meditation on this chapter of Psalm 119, I'm like, man, direct me in the path of your commands because it really puts me Bob being on a high. Direct me in the path of your commands for there I find delight, pleasure, a good feeling, enjoyment, happiness. And then he goes on to say, turn my heart, Lord, towards your written instructions. Don't go the other way and turn my heart towards selfish gain. And then he says, well, turn my eyes away from worthless things. God, I know that there was a time in my life that I read some written you know, material, some philosophy stuff with my eyes that, that caused my, me to have problems with battling doubts in my experience just because my eyes read worthless stuff that, that I that there was the, you know worldly types of attitudes toward God and and, and 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 what life is all about and it was worthly worthless crap and I really believe it was demonic and after reading it with my eyes I started battling doubts well that's worthless crap that's why the psalmist says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. And that could be anybody's experience. If whatever is worthless to that person that puts their eyes on stuff that, that they really don't need to be looking at. Amen. So it's whatever the case is with whatever person. I've got my issue with it. Amen. Somebody else might have another issue with it of their variety. But at least it's the principle that is true for all of us. Turn our eyes away from worthless things preserve our life according to your word and fulfill your promise to your servant because then our response is going to be well we revere you we honor we respect you and then Lord he adds take away the disgrace I dread for your laws are good And then he says, 
How I long for your guiding principles. Preserve my life in your righteousness, which is the opposite of my righteousness. Yes. So, Father, here's my, my little summary. My comment on the Psalm 119, the verses 33 to verse 40 that I just reviewed. Here's my comment on my survey. And God, I just ask you to give me the words to speak. Just give me the words to speak as I give my commentary section of this message. Just give me the words to speak. Starting with your decrees, Lord. Ezekiel 18.4 The soul that sins shall die. That is your decree, Lord. The soul that sins shall die. And that, a dec that decree, the soul that sins shall die, is good news because we did not have to physically die to get the benefit of your decree in Ezekiel 18.4 that the soul that sins will die. Lord Jesus, it is good news because on the cross... Your decree is that everybody in Romans 5, 6 that was weak or sick or ungodly died. Your decree is that in Romans 5, 7, everybody that lacked righteousness or goodness died on that cross. Your decree in Romans 5, 8 is that everyone that was still being an unrepentant sinner died on that cross because of a legal decree that the soul that sins must die. And Jesus, you, the Word of God, you, the living God, you became human. You became human. You did. You became human. Why? So that you could die. Because you couldn't die in your eternal spiritual being. Because eternal spiritual being of God doesn't die. So you had to become human in order to die. But it is God's decree that we died when Jesus physically died, we legally died. That's God's decree. That's Romans chapter 6 that says in seven verses in a row that when Jesus physically died, we legally died. Romans 6 verse 2, we died past tense. It's impossible for us to sin in the eyes of God because as people legally dead, then, not talking about our physical experience whatsoever in Romans 6, these seven verses in a row, it's talking about God's decree. How does the judge view things? That the man that's innocent, Jesus, in the eyes of the law, did not die on that cross. Yes, he physically experienced it, but did he legally get credit for his own death? Heck no. Which is why it says in Romans 6, 2, Amen. shall we continue... In, in, in you know Romans 6 1 asks the question shall we continue in sin so that the grace may abound and then the answer is given in the next verse heck no meganoito in Greek almost cussing like one translator went all the way and said hell no in the translation heck no about the sin why because it's impossible for someone legally declared as dead to commit a sin. Amen. And that's why it says in Romans 6, 2, we died of past tense to the sin. How can anyone live in relationship to sin if they've been declared legally executed already? Because it's God's decree. And I'm saying in Psalm 119, verse 33, Lord, teach us your decrees because then we're going to be able to follow them all through our life to the end, all the way to the end. We're going to be able to live this way constantly, constantly, constantly. The law of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit in Romans 8, 2, the law of the Spirit like a law of gravity principle, the law of the Spirit of the life in association with the innocent Jesus Christ that we are in Him. Uh, everybody in the world is. We just got to be taught, 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 taught. That's why he asks you, Lord. He says, give me understanding. Give me understanding and then I'll, then I'll keep and obey your law of forgiveness. Your law of declaring the old person to be crucified. The new creation identity is always a reality to live in all the time. Teach me so that I will obey the law of the spirit of life with all my heart all the time. That's why he keeps saying directly in the path of your commands. The new commands are written on our heart. 
That's what it says in Jeremiah 31, 33. It's a new approach to the covenant. Do you write your teachings on our heart? And why do you write them on our heart? Because it's not our responsibility in, in the new covenant. It's you that said you would take responsibility for teaching us and writing your teaching on our heart. And then we would keep, you know, your commands to the end. So thank you, Jesus, that, that you direct us in the path of your commands. Please do so. Please direct us in the path of your commands. Because the commands are good because Jesus fulfilled them all. Jesus, every one of the commands you fulfilled. And we've already been given credit for keeping every single one of them. Because when you kept them, you kept them on behalf of all of humanity. Not on behalf of your innocent self. Did you keep them? Because you didn't need to keep them. You didn't need to come down from heaven and become a human being on the earth. To be born under the law. And to keep all the commandments. You didn't need to do it. But you did it because you love us. Because there was an old covenant system that required obedience on our part. And you came down in the person of Jesus, Father. And you did everything on behalf of us to establish peace for us. In Isaiah 26, 12, Lord, you established peace for us because you have accomplished all of our required works for us. So thank you, Jesus, that you've done it. And that's why we want you again to direct us in the path of your commands. Because that's where we find delight. We find pleasure. We find happiness yes. in the realization of all that you have done for us. You fulfilled every one of the 614 commandments, Jesus. Yeah, it started with the Ten Commandments, but it got extended to 614. Lord, but you kept them all. And that's called grace. Yes. That's called grace, that you did it on our behalf. And then that lets us have peace. That's why the Apostle Paul starts his letter in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 with the statement, God our Father is sending a message. The Lord Jesus who is anointed is sending a message. Grace and peace to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you established peace for us because the grace is that you accomplished all that was required of a human being to be pleasing in your sight. And Jesus, you are the human being pleasing in your sight, but you're also the representative of every man, woman, boy that ever would be born into the world and would ever live in the future on planet Earth, that you, Jesus, timelessly represent all people in and of yourself because you are the appointed representative from God our Father who loves us all. And in John 3.16, gave us Jesus. The Father loved the world so much that he gave us Jesus. And we all have Jesus because Jesus you're given as the representative that is our intercessor, our high priest, our mediator, our advocate, our spokesman, the one who is our wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and our savior, redemptive savior. Thank you, Jesus. And then, and then he added those prayers, Lord Jesus, that he longs for your guiding principles, Lord. He actually says, Lord, that he wants to be regulated by the laws that are good. Take away the disgrace I dread because for your laws are good. Lord Jesus, these laws are all over the place in the apostolic teaching when the apostles talk about James 2.12, the law of freedom, or Romans 3.27, the law of the faithfulness of God. Or if we're talking about Romans 8.2, the law of the spirit of the life that has freed us, that has liberated us from the earlier law that required a human being to perform to get free from sin and to even have to receive forgiveness so they didn't get forgiveness. No, all that's over with because Jesus, having uttered the words on the cross, it is finished, uttered God's decree that it is finished. That in Romans 7, 1, a person is only under the law as long as they're living, but once they've died under the law's penalty, and it's the decree of Ezekiel 18, for the soul the sins will die, once they've died under the law's penalty, Romans 7, 1 says, they're no longer under the authority of the law. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, Romans 7, 1, that a human being is only under the law so long as they're living, but once they've died, they no longer live in the eyes of the law. They, they in Galatians 2.20, no longer live in the eyes of the law, but who lives in them in the eyes of the law, the anointed King Jesus that kept the whole law, legally lives in them. Whether they're experiencing it or not, it doesn't matter when it comes to the law. The law in Galatians 
is not based on faith. Galatians 3.12, the law is not based on faith. It's based on legal principles, the facts of the case. And the fact of the case is, Jesus, in Galatians 2.19, that the apostle that says, at the time Jesus died, when I was a persecutor and a violent man, and a person that, that was trying to get people to give up their faith in Jesus, talking about that man Saul in Galatians 2.19, the time when Jesus died. You know what he says in Galatians 2.19? He says, through the way that the law looks at things, I died. I saw died. I persecuted the church, died. Did he die physically? No. But did he die legally? Yes. And that's why he says in Galatians 2.19, for through the way the law looks at things, I died. And therefore, because I died, I no longer have a relationship with that law. That law can't obligate me to do anything because I'm legally dead under its penalty of death. And it got carried out because Jesus died on my behalf. And that's why on the side of resurrection, Galatians 2.19 goes on to say, on the side of resurrection, now I live for God. I don't live with the pressure of being under law. Now I live with the freedom of being under God's grace. And then he says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with the anointed high priest. I have been crucified with the anointed high priest. And in the eyes of the law, I no longer live. But legally, the anointed king lives in me. And then he gets into his experience in the rest of Galatians 2.20. And it is an experience and he said, live, that's a human experience on this earth. I live in faith, but it's not my faith. It's the faith that produces the faithfulness that is characteristic of the Son of God, the Son of God having loved me, yeah, me, the guy weak and sick, the guy without righteousness or goodness, the guy being a sinner, the guy being an enemy of God, trying to get people to recant their faith, Acts 26, 12, King Agrippa, I tried to get people to give up their faith, I tried to force people to blaspheme and to give up their faith. That's the person that is being referred to in Galatians 2.20 saying, the guy having loved me and having given himself up legally on behalf of me. Did he have to be a believer to get credit for being put to death for his sin? No. Did he only have to be a criminal that was guilty of a capital crime? Yes. Did that get executed on behalf of him? Yes. Did it get executed on behalf of every human being? Yes. Is it a good standing? Is every human being in good standing with God? Does God love everybody? He, to, has He forgiven everybody? Does He give everybody, uh, you know, the cloak of, of Jesus' righteousness just to wrap around them in tenderness? Yes. Well, these are the decrees that I'm going off on. And that's why I'm going to say it one more time with the understanding of the decrees that I'm talking about. The prophetic new covenant decree. In review, Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Lord, teach me the way of your decrees. Then I may follow the way of your decrees to the end. Give me understanding. Then with all my heart, I'll keep and obey your law. Direct me in the path of your commands. For in the path of your commands I get high. I find delight and pleasure and a good feeling and enjoyment and happiness. When it comes to the issue of my heart, turn my heart towards your written instructions. And don't go the other way with my heart. Don't turn my heart towards selfish gain. Lord, turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. <coughs> Fulfill your promise to your servants so that you may be honored, respected, worshipped, and revered. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your guiding principles. Preserve my life in, not my righteousness, in your righteousness. 